James <laughs> Huck. How is it going, mate? I'm all good, Nith. Thank you. I tell you How what, you? if my 15-year-old self could see me now, <laughs> he'd be absolutely buzzing because I'm sat with James Huck. It's amazing. <laughs> uh, having a good day? I, oh, great, great, great to be here. Thanks for having me on, Nith. You're welcome. Thank you for being here. We are in your old home. Feel the dreams, yeah? How does it feel to be here? It's great, yeah. We just, were just talking before, weren't we, about, <clears throat> you know, how... What a, what a great stadium it is and last weekend this place was was rocking with a Cardiff Swansea football game and yeah you know something great about being in in a stadium like this and so many memories here for myself personally as well yeah yeah I'm into history at the moment and something that I'm fascinated by is the whole Coliseum thing men go into battle yeah. the warrior spirit of a stadium and and I feel it like I was, as I was setting up, I had to just stop what I was doing and just <laughs> check it out and then just stand in reverence of just something about it, isn't it? Like battle, that that warrior spirit that happens here is incredible. Yeah, it is. And uh, like I say, it's, it's an amazing stadium. And when this place is full, obviously it's a lot more busy for the football at the moment. But uh, you yeah. know, when, when the Ospreys play the Scarlets and, you know, it's pretty near capacity, it's, uh, oh, it's an amazing stadium, great atmosphere. And yeah. Uh, yeah, like I say, a lot of memories for myself here as well. Love it. Yeah. So usually my first question is favourite football team. Right. But I don't know, it feels inappropriate. <laughs> do, you, do you have a favourite football team? Uh, I probably don't really. Growing up, I used to enjoy watching Tottenham. Mm. Don't ask me why, I don't, I don't know. I have um, no idea why, to be honest. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> my favourite footballer when I was growing up was like Darren Anderton. Okay, Remember yeah, him, striker yeah, for Spurs, yeah. and he used to have his... Uh, his football kit, the, the yellow Tottenham kit with Anderton in the back. And, yeah, so. and I enjoyed watching my United. I um, like my I got three boys now. Um, my eldest, he, he flicks back and forth, you know, he enjoys watching Swansea, enjoys watching my United, Man City. I think we just enjoy watching football, but yeah, yeah. I wouldn't uh, you know, pin my uh, my stripes on any team really. <laughs> it feels even weirder to ask you, do you did you ever have a favourite rugby team? Uh I used, to, I used to be bored by for Aberavon growing up. Um, obviously, my local club yeah. grew up in Batalbet, so that was probably the team I watched pretty much every single week, home and away. Mm. Um, and I think growing up as well, obviously, watched Wales. Um, and I used to love the All Blacks as well, and yeah. just watching them play and the hacker and stuff like that is uh, something I loved as, as a boy, you know? Ah, oh, it's just fascinating. Yeah. Favourite band? Stereophonics. Is it? Yeah, 100%. Love Definitely them. Love Wales. them. <laughs> the hundred, it's uh, the, from a, from a kid listening to them to now I went to watch them in Singleton Park just before yeah. lockdown and it's one of the best concerts I've, I've ever been to. Amazing. Just they played all the classic songs and uh, yeah, sick. Favorite food, <sighs> steak and chips. Any particular restaurant for those? Uh, steak and chips? Not really, not really. My mother-in-law cooks a, a crack and steak and chips, so <laughs> yeah, she she'd be happy with that. Brownie points, brownie Love points, it. yeah. But, Favorite TV show? Oh, what now or just when I was growing up? Um, oh, now, now, no, growing up. Go on, give, grow, give me both. Growing up, I used to love Saved by the Bell. Yeah, who's uh, one of my all-time favorites. I was. Um, now, I, I, do you know what? I don't watch a, a great deal of telly. I think come kind of sort of coaching and stuff in the day. By the time we get back, and I'm sorting the kids out. When I get into bed, I'm I'm gone. I'm straight to sleep. So, yeah, yeah. Um, I just put something on Netflix. I was watching a documentary the other day on Netflix called Bad Sport, which is about the... Oh, yeah. Have you seen that? Mate, I watched the, the first episode. With uh, the basketball. Yeah. yeah. Incredible. Bonkers. Mad, isn't it? Yeah. Only in America. Yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah. You just wouldn't fathom that here, oh, would you? Oh, my God. No. And, well, I watched, watched, I watched two episodes. That one with the basketball and with uh, Hansi Cronia as well. The cricketer. That's another episode later on. Oh, I haven't seen um, that. It's, it's incredible. It's, uh, so that's what I'm watching at the moment. I wouldn't mm. say it's my favourite, but it's yeah, good. I just just watch whatever's uh, current, really. Yeah, yeah. Last quick fire. Who's your hero? Oh, sporting hero. Or uh, just in general, just life hero. Just in general. Uh, I think my my family is a big <coughs> part of me growing up. You know, my grandparents, big supporters of me. So like they are my real life heroes along with my, my parents and my brother and sister and things and obviously now my, my wife and kids mm. um, but rugby wise and growing up I used to love watching Neil Jenkins <laughs> he's in the 90s he won a great deal to shout about from a Welsh point of view apart from probably Neil Jenkins and then yeah. when I got into the Welsh squad just having him as a, as a kicking coach and 
almost a bit of a mentor, really. He's uh, surreal, like, you know? Yeah, yeah. Ah, the, the 90s was a tough, tough time to grow up as a Welsh supporter. Yeah, yeah. yeah Neil Jenkins, Scott Gibbs. <clears throat> uh, yeah. Yeah, just, it was tough. <laughs> I remember I was doing a speaking engagement of, yeah. um, probably about two years ago now. And I looked out into the crowd and Scott Gibbs was there and it definitely put some nerves in my, uh, in my speaking, <laughs> but memories of 99. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Just, yeah. Nineties were tough. Your era was a little bit better. A and little bit. Yeah. On that note, tell us a bit about yourself. I'm sure most people watching this will know who you are, but for those that don't tell us a bit about yourself. Um, yeah. So grew up, I played rugby since the age of five. Um, I got an elder brother, um, Mike, who's two years older than me got a younger sister who's two years younger than Dean as well and just played with with my brother's team when I was five because the age group started at under eight so I didn't mm. actually have my own team then so I sort of played with his age group for a, for a year or two there's a coach called Di Braga who'd who chucked me on at the end for, for the last two minutes because I was too young you'd, you'd never sort of do it now nowadays but um my kit was drowning me so I'd just be on the sideline <laughs> Pulling Dai's uh, top, asking me, asking him where I can go on, you know. <laughs> um, and yeah, grew up with Abraham Quinns, played right the way through until sort of under 12s, so where I joined Abraham Juniors then. Went across to Abraham Youth, played three years Abraham Youth. Um, then started getting a little bit more serious then. I moved to British Steel, played a season there, whilst I was still with the Ospreys Academy. Mm. Um, and then moved to Neath, which was semi-professional. Mm. Um, and then to, to the Ospreys in Wales and you know just obviously I think it was 20 when I had my first cap for Wales and yeah retired just before lockdown so crazy you had, you had quite the <coughs> career how many Grand Slams did you have in that career? Uh, two Grand Slams and a, and a Six Nations yeah incredible incredible you 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 saved my youth because it was <laughs> it, as I said those 90s were tough yeah it was great on the football side Man United yeah, yeah. but uh, well not on the Welsh football side <laughs> no. but uh, for Man United as a kid and then Welsh rugby was always the heartbreak of the Six Nations until your generation came along and it was it was incredible so going back to when you started out and and touching on your book as well because you're an incredible <laughs> author now and uh, winning awards for that as well yeah. which is amazing and I was reading the opening chapter of your book and it just took me back to playing football and rugby on the street <clears throat> and you just envisage that your street is yeah. the theater of dreams mm. or the millennium or principality stadium you you think you are there in yeah. that moment and that's the opening chapter of your book and then your mum shouts tea is ready yeah. <laughs> and it all comes crumbling down and you realize you're just a 10 year old kid yeah but for you, when you had those dreams, were they almost more than dreams? Because f- for the rest of us, it's like, I probably never achieved that. No, I, I, I think it's exactly the same as any other kid. I, I, when I was a kid, I, I never knew I'd go on and play for Wales and the Lions and yeah. have a career I did. I Just like any other kid, you, you, it's, it's really important to have dreams. And that's why that first chapter and, and first couple of pages in the book is so powerful because hopefully every kid and an adult who reads it can can relate to it and I remember just watching the internationals back in the 90s and you know my, my mother be screaming on the tv like <laughs> like thousands of mothers up and down the country when <laughs> Wales are playing and as soon as the game finished my grandparents lived just behind us so there's a little sort of street in between our house and my grandparents house and we used to go and get the sand from my grandfather's garden put it on the street and use it as a, as a kick in tea yeah and it like wreck wreck my grandfather's uh, grandfather's street with with sand everywhere and just pretend we you know we were in, in the arms park and pretend to be Neil Jenkins use his kicking style and yeah. just put yourself in, in that moment and uh, yeah hopefully that that first chapter in the book sort of sort of shows shows that really yeah oh, yeah I love it because it just took me there it took me to yeah. being a kid and and having I still today uh, I was sharing with you earlier for my own professional life still have those <clears throat> big dreams where I believe anything is possible mm. I'm, I'm thinking about when you were on the side of that pitch as a young kid and you, you know the first team no right to go on the pitch you drowned <laughs> in your in your um uh in your kit but you're tugging on the coach's <laughs> jacket saying put me in yeah. that's that's rare like i wouldn't have had that confidence <laughs> where did that confidence come from do you think i don't know i don't know um <clears throat> my, my three boys now they, they're pretty confident and um you know, it's, it's it's not an arrogance. I think you just, as a kid, you, you want to be on the pitch, don't you? Yeah, I think you yeah. you get dressed up on a Sunday morning or Saturday morning if you're playing football, whatever it is, and 
you, you want to be involved in playing, you know. And I know I was only five at the time, so the reason I wasn't playing was because you know the boys were two, three years older than me. But uh, yeah, he wanted to get on the pitch and, and get amongst it and and be out there playing. That's a, that's a main thing at that age, you know. Yeah, just the the joy of it, yeah. playing for the joy of it, and. Yeah, I think we can miss that in our lives, that it actually there's a lot of joy to be found in those mm. moments. Yeah. You know, you're going to battle on the rugby rugby field, but still there's joy in it. There's joy in that play, joy in yeah. the, the freedom of the field and, and all that good stuff. So you go from being a kid, tugging on your coach's <laughs> uh, jacket to get in the game to these high-pressure situations as a taking kicks yeah. for Wales. Yeah. What was that like? What were the, those high-pressure moments? Yeah, <sighs> you... Until you sort of look back and when you finish and reflect on on games and things, you you don't really think about it too much. It's just like something you've you've always sort of done and something yeah. probably at the age of sixteen, um, sixteen, seventeen. Cause I was a scrum half until the age of sixteen. Yeah, I moved to outside half and obviously I was goal kicking a lot then when I, when I joined British Steel. I wasn't a great goal kicker at all at the start. Yeah. I had to work really really hard, and but it was something I loved. I used to love just grabbing a bag of balls, eight to ten balls, and I'd walk to my local pitch in Baglan, which would take sort of 20, 25 minutes, and I'd kick for hours. And I used to love just being out there on my own and just kicking and kicking and kicking. And I'd put pressure on myself, and I'd say to myself, right, do 10 kicks in, in you know, pretty tough spots on the pitch. And if I didn't kick them, I wouldn't leave, you know? And, Mad. Yeah, I just, but I'd just, I'd just love it. I'd love it, you know? And when I was young, I had a lot of time in my hands. So yeah. that was the one thing that just, just I, I loved and enjoyed. And obviously it benefited me going forward then, you know? Ah, oh, mate, it's mad because, again, in, in our professional life as musicians, I, I call it putting the reps in. So mm. I have a drum kit set up next to my desk. And this is a recent thing. Yeah. Those that have seen me drumming will understand it's a recent thing. But I'm like, I'm just putting in the reps because mm. I want to be able to do this no matter who's in front yeah. of me. And that is mad to think, you know, 50, 60,000 fans screaming, sometimes booing. Yeah. And you're just like, yeah, I've done this thousands of times before. It's no different. Yeah. Was there ever an intimidating <laughs> moment? Was there any like sort of moment where it did get to your head? Um, I think you play in all types of atmospheres. And I played in France for three years where it's loud, it's noisy. Um, I think as a kicker, Ireland was, was, I wouldn't say tough, it's just different because when you line up for a kick, there's total respect for the kickers and it's ah. dead silence. You can hear a, a pin drop or you can hear the sirens on the outside of the ground miles away because it's so silent. I, th I find that more intimidating than yeah. someone booing and stuff. You know, if someone's booing and didn't really bother me really, it was, yeah. it was that deafening silence that uh, was, was different and, and unique, you know, for the kicker really. Yeah, that's mad. All eyes on you yeah. in that moment. I think for the rest of us regular folks or prop forwards as I was back <laughs> in the day, <laughs> so I just can't fathom that moment. Mm. And I can see how the silence would be deafening yeah. and uh, and frightening. What about some best memories from playing rugby? Uh, like loads, loads of memories. And like the memories you spoke about growing up with Abraham Quinns, you know, as, as a youngster, I there was a, a woman, um, my 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 mate Darren Payne, who I played with. His mother used to film with with a camcorder every single game, <laughs> and uh, we used to get the, the VCR tapes off her, and we used to Man. love it after the games. We used to be ringing up, ringing up Darren. Has your mother put the tape onto the cassette yet? We want to watch it, and just looking back at those tapes, I still got them now. And what I need to do actually is is transfer them to like a USB or something because there's so many memories on yeah. on those tapes, and you know of the tries and. And the tournaments we were involved in, so they are my early memories, which, which I loved. Um, and then just from from the game, my professional game, you know, like you said, winning Grand Slams, my first cap out in Argentina. Mm. Um, you know, I played for I was playing for Neath, and I got selected for Wales uh, before I'd even started a match for the Ospreys, which was wow. pretty pretty nuts, really. And mm. uh, I was on the bench for the first test against Argentina, got on, won my first cap, and then started the second test. So Mad. that was a great, great memory. And yeah, just, just winning trophies. And I think once you've achieved your first cap, it's, it's almost like, right, you've, you've had that. You won more of it, and, and you want to win trophies then. And uh, yeah. like I said, we, luckily, we, we managed to do that. Something we sp I've spoken about before is imposter syndrome. Mm -hmm. And I get it a lot in, in, in music and in my career. 
And if you don't know what imposter syndrome is, it's basically like, what am I doing here? I don't deserve to be <laughs> here. It's that notion. But one thing that helps that is watching back footage or listening mm. to recordings or, um, you know, nowadays it's game tapes and checking out the opponent's game tapes yeah. so you can have confidence in how yeah. you're playing, uh, checking out your own tapes from training or previous games. But for you as a kid, no one had tapes. All I had <laughs> when I was playing rugby was Lloyd Ashley's mother shouting <laughs> on the sideline, come on, Lloyd. That's all I had. Uh, so that must have been something that really helps, like seeing your performance. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Um, <clears throat> but I never looked at the tapes for for, for confidence. You know, like I just, just love watching the tapes back. You yeah, know? And yeah, yeah. I think as you got older, you know, you'd, you'd look back and, you know, we used to have a psychologist in, in the well squad who would make DVDs of the boys' best bits, which, you know, would would then sort of reinforce what, what you already know, really, you know. But mm. um that that was quite uh, quite cool, you know, and it's nice to nice to have, I suppose, in professional rugby you've got got the, the tapes and the, the footage, yeah. you know, first hand then whenever you want it, which which is good and yeah, you know, if just try and delete the bad games, you know. Yeah, yeah. Oh one hundred percent. Don't know and need to remember that stuff. Yeah, I know. <laughs> what about some tough moments, some negative moments, some challenging moments? <clears throat> I think as I had a 15, 16 year professional career, so it, you know, you have lots of highs, but there's loads of, of, of lows and bad games. I think the one that sticks out for me and probably a lot of boys involved in the squad was the 2011 World Cup uh, semi-final. Mm. Great being in the semi-final, but losing to France, you know, the way we did. And yeah. again, talking about kicking, you know, I missed a couple of kicks. There was Stephen Jones, Lee Halfpenny, I think we missed a couple of kicks and we only lost a game by by a couple of points. And you just you always look back and think, if one of those kicks goes over, it's a different story in a World Cup yeah, final. Yeah. Um, was that when Warburton got sent that's off? That's it, yeah, yeah. I mean... You didn't, the ref wasn't exactly... Uh, yeah, <laughs> I, exactly. But, you know, I think it's always when you look back, I think, flipping it, we were that close. Like, yeah. you know, and, and New Zealand obviously won the World Cup, but they weren't, you know, they were sort of crippled by injuries a little bit. Um, and it was, we had a great team and it was there for the taking. So that was a tough moment. And actually, we lost to France and I'd signed for, for Perpignan. So straight after that World Cup, I was going out to France. To the enemy. Which <clears throat> sounds like, oh, you know, you lost to France, you're going out there, but it was probably the best thing for me because coming back to Wales after being knocked out of the World Cup and probably not having my best game probably would have been tough. It was tough anyway. Mm. But just to get out on the field away from a bit of a goldfish bowl, you know, it was um, a sort of a blessing in disguise, I suppose. Did you feel, because I, I shared before we, we started, like watching those Six Nations, did you feel like you were carrying the weight of a nation? Because as a, as a part of that nation... I looked forward to that all yeah. year. You were our heroes. Like, did you feel that pressure carrying that weight? Kind of. When I first started, it was, it was total excitement. Like we spoke about it before, it was just I, I had a little bit of nerves. But growing up, my first you know couple of years for Wales, just full of excitement. I couldn't wait for the game. You know, yeah. I couldn't sleep because I was so excited. You know, and I didn't really feel the nerves so much. You know, they didn't get to me. Um, I remember my first Six Nations game against England. We'd lost um, pretty much every game, and if we'd have lost to England, we'd have had the wooden spoons. So it was in Cardiff, two thousand and seven, and I'd grown up, you know, with listening to Stereophonics as long as you beat the English, <laughs> watching Wales, England, and that's that's the one you want to win. And yeah. I was starting at ten, and I was like, I just was pinching myself because I couldn't believe it, and so excited. And we ended up winning that game. I won man of the match, and it was just an incredible feeling. So I didn't feel the pressure of of the nation, and I just felt complete excitement and. Just almost grateful it was out there, you know? Yeah, yeah. I suppose as well, <laughs> random guy, <laughs> I suppose being Welsh, like you grow up as a Welsh fan, you probably just wanted a win just because you are yeah, Welsh and yeah. you've got to beat the English. And there's, <clears throat> now you were kind of making your own pressure in that moment. I yeah, suppose, yeah, exactly. So. And, you know, you realise what it means to, to support us. So, you know, you, you sort of get that pressure. But, you know, I think as later on in my career, and when you build a sort of reputation... It sort of sounds strange, but you sort of, then you start feeling the pressure because there's pressure on you to, to perform because people know what you can do and you're expected to perform to that level mm. every single time. And yeah, I yeah. think, you know, we're human beings at the end of the day, we're not robots, so, you know, there's going to be ups and downs. Yeah. And when you don't perform then, that, then the sort of pressure comes on. But I suppose, it's, you know, at, at the start, you know, with youth and there's no pressure, you just get out there and enjoy it. Yeah. Were you always confident stepping onto the pitch? Um... No, I wouldn't say I was always confident. I think 
like I said, in the early part of my career, and a lot of times I was confident. I believed in my own ability, but I think it's like anything, you know, like as a musician or football player, rugby player, you know, just just you know your regular job. You know, if you, if you have a couple of bad days, yeah. it makes you think a little bit, doesn't it? And yeah, you know, yeah. you you just got to try and. I suppose, yeah, reinforce whether there's footage of, you know, yourself, the good bits, um, just speaking to family or whatever, just to sort of help you and, and, sh and show you that, you know, you're there for a reason, you know what I mean? And yeah. uh, you, you are good enough. So, yeah, I wouldn't say I was always confident. I think everyone who said every single game they were really confident, you know, because if you have three or four bad games, then it's going to it's gonna knock you a little bit, you know, yeah, I don't care yeah. who you are. Yeah, I feel for um, Timo Werner, like... That guy's confidence, or you know, it was Fernando Torres back in mm. the day, mm. or I mean, Oli Gunnar Solskjaer right now. Like when you're caught in that spell, like bad spell mm. of a bad couple of games, or you've had a bad couple of days at work, and for some of us, like those days go on for a long yeah, yeah, time. Like yeah. Timo is struggling to find form. You mentioned game tapes helping. Is there anything else you can do to get out of that kind of headspace? <clears throat> well, I speak about the 2011 when we lost to France. So my my first game, you know, because we had the World Cup, and then the worst thing probably then is is to have that long sort of three four months off, whatever it is. Probably, probably about three months off. Um, the, for the best thing to do was to play straight away because yeah. you want to get that bad game out of the way. If you had a good game, then you can sort of enjoy that, but. I was waiting for a while. My first game for Perth, you know, was against Toulouse. Um, mm. and I think you just take it one game at a time. And I just mm. I played played pretty well. We lost the game, but you know I, I went well. So you, you take confidence, man. It's almost building blocks, and one step at a time. Yeah, My second yeah. game, I we played Exeter in the in the European Cup. I won a man of the match, and then you sort of just build confidence from from performances like that. Then you know, and yeah. that that's the way I got out of it. You know, and and. And again, it's not plain sailing because you know it's good games, bad games. But mm. I think that that's that's the way I dealt with it anyway. What about intimidation? Overcoming intimidation. We, we spoke about the hacker. Uh, I've always wondered what it would be like to face that. Is it is it as intimidating <clears throat> as it seems, or does it like stir you up and actually encourage you? I, I, I absolutely love it. It's a little bit intimidating, you know. But like I said, growing up, I used to watch. The games in my grandparents' house, the Welsh games, and, and particularly against New Zealand, I used to watch uh, tapes again, VCRs of, of New Zealand documentaries, and I was obsessed with the hacker. So yeah. I'd be performing the hacker in, in my grandparents' house in front of the fire. <laughs> Me and my brother would have our tops off, and you know we'd be having our tongues out, pretending you know to be to be part of the hacker. And then I remember my very my very first time facing the hacker. Well, actually, my very first time was when I don't know if you remember New Zealand did the hacker in the changing room. Yes. Because there was a dispute where the WIU wanted the Welsh National Anthem to, to be done last. So they felt yeah, the yeah, All Blacks yeah. have an advantage by doing the hacker last. Yeah. So they said, you do the hacker first on the pitch, then we'll have the anthems, and then we'll get going. But they were like, no, no, it's tradition. We always do the hacker last. So they were like, fair enough, we'll do the hacker first, but we'll do it in the change room out of the way of everyone. So it was my first time facing the All Blacks. I was like, I can't believe this. I'm not going to see the hacker. Oh. You know, and luckily I had plenty of other opportunities to face it. Yeah. And I just, I just remember standing there the first time I did face it on the pitch and I was just thinking of what it was like in my, in my grandparents' house and when I was pretending to do it and I was like watching all these boys, Richie McCaw, Dan Carter, and like, you, 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 you're pinching yourself. And I didn't feel intimidated. I just loved every second of it. Yeah. That's the thing with intimidation. Sometimes it's like, like I get intimidated by stuff and I'm like, yeah, but I'd also kill to be in this yeah, situation. Yeah. Like, I'm sure if you allow it to be, the, the hacker can be this mountain that you've got to face. Mm. But it's also epic. Yeah. And it's like such a privilege to yeah. be there. Um, when I spoke with Mo, my mate that works for the BBC, it was like, I was, he was talking about a busy schedule and he's like, put. Like I'm so blessed to have it. Yeah, like, yeah. It's just an amazing opportunity. It is. It is. Did you? Fa uh, I think you were. Were you in the Lions team that like squared right up for the hacker? Uh, no, there was a Welsh team. So th oh, that was uh, 2008. Oh yeah. So yeah. So we. The reason for that was with Gatlin, obviously New Zealander. Yeah. He felt we should have a response, and you, you see lots of teams doing different sort of things, whether they they walk up close to the hacker or Gatlin just just thought that. Because when they do the hack in New Zealand, they, they obviously sort of face you and, you know, wait for you to sort of turn away. But he was like, no, no, we'll stand there. We'll, we'll have a standoff and we won't turn until they do. So the hacker finished. We stood there. They stood there. Nobody, you know, turned, turned away. The referee was saying to Ryan Jones, 
look, you know, we got to get on with the game. And we like, no, no, we don't move in until they move in. And it was like <laughs> two minutes of, you know, you watch on YouTube now, it's uh, an unbelievable amount of views because just you you could feel the atmosphere. It was incredible. Bonkers. Yeah, and then yeah. eventually then New Zealand did turn away. And then we got stuffed by 50 points. So. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, for, for that moment, that two minutes was uh, was amazing. Yeah, yeah. Ah, oh, mate. Some of the, like, uh, and you're creating memories for me as like a Welshman. <laughs> I love it. I love it. <clears throat> we, something that we uh, I've spoken about on here before is like, we see someone like yourself and we think you are confident in every area of life. Is that the case? Or do you lack confidence in, in other areas of life? Um. I think I'm, I'm quietly confident. I'm not <clears throat> not outwardly spoken yeah. in terms of you know I'm not confident like that. I suppose, but I'm quietly confident in in my ability with things you know and um, on the rugby pitch. I think in sport as well, it's important to sort of even if you're not confident, show it you know because yeah, it's a sign yeah. of weakness end for the opposition. So I think that's that's really important. And you know, there's better better players than me who, who show their confidence. Like Mike Phillips, for example, is whether he's confident inside or not, he always shows it. And yeah, yeah. you know, it, I think that. that you know, made him have the career he did. You know, she's a talented player as well, but mm. he's known for his confidence, which is which is great. And a lot of people can't can't be like that, you know, and yeah. you know show it that way. So I think it's in sport is really important. And the transition from being you know sportsman into an author mm. was that something you were like? I'm confident I can do this, <clears> or you like, ooh, this is a new mountain I got to face. Like I actually need to sharpen my tools here, or was it just a smooth transition? Yeah, it's obviously a new new challenge for me, but. It was just something I, I wanted to do. I f saw like a little gap in the market there for for yeah. rugby books for kids because I remember growing up loving rugby like many kids in Wales. So many football books and nothing nothing for for kids in terms of rugby. So yeah, yeah. I was confident that I wanted to get it out there. And, and obviously Dave Braley, who, who I co-author the book with, is is fantastic. And I approached Dave through um, Mal Pope, a family friend of ours, oh, yeah. uh, who you probably know. Yeah. Uh, he, was, he was a great guy. Um, and yeah, I was really confident in in what we were doing there. It's a new challenge for me, but I knew it was definitely something that probably was needed. And you know, the, what what I find great now is obviously we won the award with book one, but the, the photos and the messages we get from from kids and parents yeah. saying like how much you've you've helped my son or daughter. You know, they love the book. You know, the the confidence they take. They weren't involved in rugby or interested in rugby until they read the book, and that that's really really pleasing and you know yeah, you know you've yeah. done something positive then you know oh mate it's so good yeah you can't compare to those those moments of actually emotionally changing someone's trajectory yeah. you know it's well i guess is one thing to get people excited in a game of rugby but to actually change someone's life or change their the path they're going on because mm -hmm. <clears throat> reading your book i'm like oh, i'm back there i'm a kid <laughs> inspired and as you said i remember countless football books i read telling me I could be the next Ronaldo or yeah. uh, the Brazilian Ronaldo at the time <laughs> and like whatever it was. And it was the dreams were all on the football pitch. Yeah. And it's great that kids have that, that same ambition that they can strive for anything on the rugby pitch. And, yeah. You know, that's amazing. What about legacy? What if you could, you know, in 40 years <clears throat> time, sit down with the grandkids by the fire <laughs> And tell them stories about your life. What legacy do you want to leave? What do you want to leave behind? Oh, I, I just want to be, first of all, it sounds a bit cliche, but a good human being. Like, you know, and I think I got yeah. three boys and try and teach them to to grow up the right way. You know, if you get success on a rugby pitch, football pitch, you know, just a you know, regular job, whatever it is, just obviously you want to be successful. But I think just, just being a good human being, I think, is, is really important. It goes a long yeah. way. And, yeah. you know, I, a lot of people say, you know, nice guys come last sometimes, but I think it's really important just to be just a just a nice person and, and grow up with the the right the right way really. And you know, I, mm. I think I thank my family for the way they've brought brought me up and I'll try and do the same with, with my kids and then yeah. any success you get in the future after that is 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 great, you know. Yeah. Yeah, character goes a long way. Mm. And I'm I'm learning that through I learned it through my twenties and into my thirties that character can carry you really far yeah. and like integrity and humility yeah. and honesty and all these different things you don't really get taught in school but no. it's like you know algebra has got me nowhere <laughs> yeah <laughs> characters got me you know to a good point in life yeah I'm, yeah i'm pretty happy and so something I, I don't remember being taught in in rugby practice is leadership mm. um and how 
being a good leader comes with good character. <clears throat> so Lloyd Ashley was our um, captain uh, in school. And uh, it was just something that was natural in him, that leadership mentality. On the rugby pitch, we were following him, you know? Yeah. Um, have you ever thought about, was that something that was talked around the, the dressing room, the changing room, like good leadership and stuff? Or I think we never I never really taught it. Um, I, was, I was out at half, so you had to have yeah. a certain amount of leadership. And I felt I did a lot of my leadership if i if i had any on the pitch really as opposed to talking off the pitch you know and yeah um you know some players were played with who, who were fantastic talkers and and you know mm. really inspired a dress, dressing room but um yeah yeah i think i was never was never taught it but i think as a as a nine or a ten on the pitch you you have to have a certain amount of leadership to to guide the team around and yeah and i enjoyed you know like bossing the fours around you know calling the calls and stuff but mm. You know, there's, there's certain people who who are really good talkers in the change room as well. You know, like likes of Alan Jones, your, your Warburton's, Gareth Thomas was was a really sort of inspiring captain actually in the change room when he when he spoke, everyone listened and mm. you know really backed the players. So you know, everyone's got their different strengths and weaknesses. Yeah, it's good. It's good, mate. It's been uh, great to have you here and in such an amazing venue. Um, yeah, thank you for for joining us today and sharing. Pleasure, Nathan. No, thanks for having me, and all the best for everything. Cheers, mate. Thank you.